No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to How to Be a Real Life Superhero. Um, my name is Maria Walters, and I wanted to just talk for a minute about, um, just to clarify, this, is, this panel is really about uh, skeptical activism and how to make a difference in the world around us. So um, it's not actually about putting on masks, although uh, I've got some funny stuff that I'll show you guys in a minute about that. So I have assembled a, a group of people here who are actually real life superheroes, um, at least in my opinion. Um, and because I'm secretly a supervillain, I'm, uh, I'm now going to reveal their secret superhero identities. So uh, I'm also going to let them introduce themselves. But first, we have Jamie Bernstein. She's also known as the uh, Skeptical Ninja. Uh, Jamie is the, I, yes, I created superhero personas for all of you. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm very impressed. Um, <laughs> Jamie's the vice president of the Women, Women Thinking Free Foundation, and uh, through that has helped to run the Hug Me, I'm Vaccinated pro, pro, Im, pro Immunization Program, which, amongst other things, uh, runs vaccine clinics such as the one that we had this weekend at Dragon Con. Uh, and Jamie is a, a head researcher for a research survey studying what messaging regarding vaccine most speaks to new and expectant parents. And uh, these will eventually be uh, used to design a much more effective Hug Me campaign. So um, Jamie, you have anything else to add? Just I just want to say that Maria did probably most of the work for the clinic, and I just showed up, but somehow I'm getting all the credit, so it was mostly her. Good deal. We, we, we uh, just a quick aside, we vaccinated uh, 225 people this weekend. and it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. So uh, hopefully we'll do even better next year. Uh, next up, we have Tim Farley, also known as Internet Lad. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I like the weakness. <laughs> um, Tim is a research fellow for the James Randi Educational Foundation on Electronic Media, and he also created the website What's the Harm to track uh, the real world damage done by irrational beliefs, and he blogs at skeptools.com. <laughs> yeah. Tim, would you like to comment on anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I focused on is using the Internet to get things done because it's fun to be a skeptic from your couch. Um, and uh, we try to figure out ways that people can make a difference uh, online. And there are, there are some. Actually, there's some really neat ones that have come up just recently. So we'll talk about that. Great. Um, next we have Rebecca Watson, also known as the Skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca leads a, a team of skeptical activists at skeptic.org, um, which I am very proud to be a member of, and also appears on the weekly Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast, and she travels around the world um, delivering talks on science and atheism and feminism and skepticism, and she has an asteroid orbiting the sun with her name on it, which is really pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> uh, next up, Derek Bartholomus. Also known as Death Watch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, Derek is an investigator in the Billy Meyer UFO case, as well as the creator of the Jenny McCarthy Body Count uh, and Psychic Union websites. Um, and uh, Derek, Derek, why don't you talk a little bit about the Jenny McCarthy Body Count, um, since I have kind of focused on that in your superhero persona. <laughs> First off, I love the drawing. Jill, Jill has problems with facial hair, and I think she did a really good. Yeah, this, these, all these, all these drawings, by the way, were done by Jill Powell, who uh, just is a, an amazing artist that we work with. She also did all of the um, Vax Clinic posters. Um, yeah, she's very, really, very cool. Uh, yeah, the, the Jenny McCarthy body count was started a couple of years ago, um, because I, because uh, the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, uh, particularly Stephen Novella and Phil Plate, went on on the Bad Astronomy blog kept talking about a bunch of 
outbreaks had happened in 2008, and they would refer to her having a body count. And in January of 2009, I wondered what the number was and started to figure out how to research it. And the number, unfortunately, as of my last update, is and basically, I count the number of vaccine preventable illnesses and deaths that have occurred since Jenny McCarthy started telling parents not to vaccinate their children uh, from June 2007 to the present day. And that number of vaccine preventable illnesses is 82,321, and vaccine preventable deaths is 736. And there are, as of so far, zero cases of autism created, caused by vaccination. That's a real bummer. Thanks, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I have now brought you all down. <laughs> That's death watch for you. Uh, two of our participants actually uh, were supposed to join us, but were called away on superhero emergencies, also known as inability to schedule flights. Uh, <laughs> but uh, A. Kovacs, who I call the accomplisher, <laughs> she, uh, she does a, a, a whole bunch of stuff around organi organizing um, big science festivals and things like that. Uh, and also a Amy uh, Davis-Roth, um, who you probably know from Surly Ramics. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, catch up with them another time. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do that. And as I said, my name is Maria Walters. I tried to come up with a cool superhero identity for myself, but all I could come up with was frazzled girl. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I, I, I may actually fall over at this panel. I've <laughs> got a little bit going on. Um, <laughs> and I may have only slept for like three hours in the past three days. So anyway. There, there are tasty baked goods if you need, it, if you need a little Yeah, that's true. Meal. I do have a backup supply. Um, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's talk about, you know, for me, I think I really love the idea that the individual can make a difference in the world through their own personal actions. So let's kind of start talking about that, you know. Uh, if somebody does want to make a difference, and I'll put this out to, to any of you, um, you know, but you don't really know what to start with, um, how, how do you find an issue? Well, I think in terms of finding an issue, I, I suppose that it would, it would be what you're interested in, what makes you angry, you know, what, if you, if you listen to, to skeptical podcasts, read the blogs, um, or just even pick up a mainstream media newspaper, um, what 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 do you see there that that angers you? Even if um, let let's say let's talk about the vaccine thing because it's come up quite a bit actually. Um, I think pretty much everybody on this panel has had something to do with vaccine advocacy, um, and yet none of us are doctors. I don't think is anyone secretly a doctor? Okay, <laughs> just checking. You never know. They're a smart bunch here. Um, so. None of us are doctors, so at first blush you might think, well, what could we possibly do? We can't go out there with a needle and start jabbing people. We could, but... There are laws against <laughs> that. Probably, probably wouldn't win us any, any souls, um, so, so to speak. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we're each passionate about it, and we each have different skill sets that allows us to contribute to it. In, in my case, you know, I happen to have... A, a popular podcast and blog, uh, which I can use to get out the word, to uh, encourage people to do certain activism, uh, to, to um, encourage vaccine advocacy. There are some of you who might just, you, maybe you're a brilliant artist. Well, we can always use good artists, like you can see, you know, even in, even for something like a PowerPoint or for, you know, vaccine posters that are trying to get the word out. It's really important. We need graphic designers. That's why we have Mad Art Lab, which is about, uh, it's at madartlab.com, and it's the intersection between art and science and skepticism. Um, those things are important. So I, w I would suggest... A, find out the, uh, the issue, identify the issue that you're passionate about, and B, identify your specific skill set, what can you contribute, and then C, mash them together into a beautiful paste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would also add to that to find a niche within skepticism that you really like instead of just, you know, I'm passionate about everything. I guess that goes in with the idea thing. But it's also important just to find something that you're good at that nobody else is really doing or maybe not doing it in quite the way that you want to do it. And so kind of tied into that, what, what kind of drove you guys to actually take action? 
I mean, was it just sort of I'm really mad about something? I think I think a lot of I think for me a lot of that was for you know I was like I really just want to do something uh, about a particular issue. But are there you know? Well, for me, it, <clears throat> for me, it was curiosity. I, I, I have a um, a political blog that's currently on hiatus, and I had. I knew that in 2008 it was going to go on hiatus regardless of who won the election. And so for a few months I wasn't blogging any anymore. It was a thing where I would post at use Census Bureau statistics and so I would post new statistics every week and I kind of missed blogging every uh, putting new data up every week and hearing the the comments about all the outbreaks and and you know Jenny McCarthy having a body count. I mean that comes directly from Steve Novella saying that. Uh, and it literally was, it was the last January of 09 podcast of the Skeptics Guide, where they spent the first 15, 20 minutes, and I went, I want to do something. And I went out, registered the URL, JennyMcCarthyBodyCount.com.net and .org, and then proceeded to go figure out what the number was. And I thought, since I was so used to going through Census Bureau statistics, it would be easy to go through the Centers for Disease Control statistics. They're very different. Um, <laughs> the Census Bureau is extremely well organized. The CDC is not. And it took months to tr even try to figure out what the numbers were. And when it originally posted, I had a massive undercount because there was I used the, the uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report to come up with the data. And it turns out that there was a whole section of diseases that were listed in the, in, further down in the report that I didn't even know. Uh, so I went from the first few weeks where I had um, a few hundred uh, vaccine preventable illnesses to, it was actually someone from the CDC who contacted me and said, you don't have all the, all the, the, the diseases listed. And showed me and then told me how to fully read that report and then when I went and recalculated everything, it jumped to about 20,000. Uh, to build off of what you said uh, earlier um, uh, and, and to talk about how we moved into activism, I, you know, we started out on Skeptic and on Skeptic's Guide simply reporting on what was happening. So um, in the case of vaccines, you know, vaccine rates are dropping, disease is climbing. Um, the, such and such quack cancer cure is being promoted by this person. Um, you know, we, we would report on these things and we would get people like Derek who would hear these things and get angry about it. Uh, just hearing about it wasn't enough and they would write to us and say, but what can we do? <laughs> what can we do? And so for me, it was a demand, you know, to... <coughs> Okay, the the we're, we've raised the awareness. That's great, but now where do we go from here? So we started looking for ways we can help: letter writing campaigns, or uh, you know, just things that people can do from their home. You know, to for instance, stop quack cancer cures or or things like that. Um, and now we've got these these activists who are springing up in a very grassroots way. Um, Reese Morgan is one. Some of you may have heard of him. He's he's this kid in the UK who uh, who has Crohn's disease, which is an incurable um, digestive tract issue, uh, and it can be very painful. So uh, he he was on a forum for it. He saw a, a a a cure being promoted. That he looked into it. It turned out it was industrial strength bleach that a company was encouraging people to drink. Uh, it was called Miracle Solutions, I think. And he tried to tell people on the forum, don't do this, it's just bleach, and there's no, there's no science to show that this is helping you, and it might actively be harming you. Um, they weren't listening to him, so he took his case out into the wide open world. He contacted us at the Skeptics Guide and Skeptic. He contacted other outlets. Eventually the mainstream media picked up on it and eventually the government picked up on it and started shutting these places down. This is a 15 year old kid with, with a disease who got inspired because he wanted to do something. So it's, it's stories like that that make me realize that that's the next step. You know, you are, uh, you're already a fan of skepticism, of the po of podcasts, of blogs, or just a fan of science, what have you. Uh, that's great. You're going to the meetings now. That's great. You're, you're getting together. That's fantastic. The next step is, is activism. I think it's a natural progression. 
Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things that I really like about what, um, what, like for example, Derek has done is it's very much just one person wanting to do something. Um, and I, I kind of wanted Tim to talk a little bit about that because, Tim, you've had a lot of success with uh, using Twitter and Wikipedia and social media to kind of get things done. So can you uh, talk a little bit about some of your successes and kind of some of the easy things that people can do from the uh, comfort of their own homes, as so to speak? Yeah, there's a lot of projects out there, like Wik Wikipedia is probably the most sa uh, famous famous one where they're doing what's called crowdsourcing. So it's a it's a giant project to basically build an encyclopedia of everything. And if you wanted to do that as a real project, you'd have to spend millions of dollars and hire thousands of researchers. But instead, they put it out on the internet and they let anyone edit it. So literally, you can you know walk up, sign in, and edit an article about something that you know about your favorite uh, you know institution in your town or your where you grew up. Um, and people amazingly rise to the occasion and and write you know they've written millions of articles and and uh, and you know quite frankly a lot of it is junky stuff that's not that great but a lot of it is really really good material and it's all basically being done for free it's run as a nonprofit and there's other projects like that and it's so, many of them have skeptical angles like in, in the case of Wikipedia just getting documenting what we're doing. Uh, in the skeptic movement, making sure that articles about quack procedures and uh, unsupportable uh, products are correctly skeptical. Because if you look at the rules of Wikipedia, um, they are pro-skeptic, that, that it's supposed to be based on real evidence and real sources, and you're supposed to footnote everything. So some, a quack shouldn't be able to go on Wikipedia and make ridiculous claims about their product. So pe but people need to actually push back on that. Someone needs to pay attention and see that. And it's a great thing for someone who maybe doesn't have, you know, you know maybe you don't have a million hours to spend on this, but you have a couple hours a week that you can spend on skeptic stuff, and Wikipedia is perfect for that. You know, you can go in, spend as much or as little time as you want, and then step away from it and go back to your to your normal life. Um, another project that's come up recently is uh, this product called Web of Trust, um, which is a crowdsourced uh, way of rating websites to find because uh, it, it's basically so, it's designed to solve the basic problem of somebody sends you a link to a cool store. It's like here's this cool store that has dog hats um, and I love their products but you don't know whether or not it's safe to give that store your credit num credit card number because you've never seen that store before you know you know Amazon and, and whatnot so web of trust uh, provides a way for people to get together and you know 10 or 12 people can say yeah I bought from this store yeah I bought from this store and it gets a green rating in web of trust and then you install the software on your browser and when you go to that store it lights up green and you know that at least according to you know a few 10 or 10 or 100 people on Web of Trust, it's a safe site. Well, that goes the other way, too. People who are selling quack medicines uh, can get negative ratings. And in fact, I found a thread where right after Rice Morgan was uh, getting the word out about a, a Miracle Min Mir Mineral Solution, someone who was a Web of Trust user went out and found all the different websites where various people were selling Mir Miracle Mineral Solution and made sure that they had negative ratings on Web of Trust so that if you try to go to those sites, the thing will light up red. And literally, depending on which version of the software you have loaded, it'll literally put up a big warning on your your screen and say, warning, the site you are about to go to is not trustworthy. It's actually a problem with Web of Trust right now. Some conservative groups have actually started trolling Web of Trust and putting big warnings on liberal or skeptical stuff. Yeah. I've gone to a couple of things that I knew were good and knew were safe and get big red warnings. Yeah, well, we, we've actually, uh, be, right when I, after I blogged about Web of Trust and the skeptic movement, some, some skeptics up in Canada uh, started an, an effort to do exactly the same thing, but to protect skeptic sites. Because a lot of skeptic websites, you know, we're kind of a niche movement, and, uh, you know, the big sites like Amazon or whatever, a, a million people will rate it on Web of Trust, but a little blog like my blog that hardly anybody goes to, it didn't have any, when I first visited it on Web of Trust, it had zero ratings at all, which means that if someone wants to take 10 of their friends in there and all rate it badly, it, it can damage your rating very quickly. So what they did was set up the Watt Project, 
and basically every week they pick 10 skeptic websites and say, hey, everybody, you know, go to these 10 websites in Web of Trust and give it the rating you think it deserves, hopefully a good one, and, uh, and we'll make sure that all the skeptic websites have nice, strong, positive ratings, and hopefully an effort like that will, will be very difficult to do against skeptic websites. And it's, it's had a real effect. I, six weeks after they started the Watt project, I used some, some programming techniques to actually pull the ratings off the sites that they were rating, and there was a demonstrable difference. There was, you could measure the difference in the ratings of the site. So there, that was a case where it's literally, you know, but, three button clicks. Or, you know, in the case of Watt project, I guess maybe ten button clicks each week, and you're making a difference. So yeah, that's a, is a really great example, and there's several several things out there like that for things that are very easy and you know take very minimal resources. Um, but one of the things I think that individual activists run into is sometimes uh, the projects they want to do require more resources. Uh, and I kind of wanted to talk to Jamie about that. Um, tell us a little bit about the vaccination survey that you wanted to put together and uh, how you managed to make that happen when you really didn't have um, really any funding to do it, to do it. Yeah, so my big thing in skepticism was I wanted to do something, um, but I didn't know what I, for a long time I just couldn't figure out how my skills could fit in. And I had a bunch of ideas and they were all huge and they all required more than just me. They weren't like little things that I could do. Um, I'm My background is in statistics and survey design and um, that kind of thing. So. I came up with this idea. I realized we've been we've been doing with Women Thinking Free Foundation. We run the Hug Me I'm Vaccinated campaign, so we've been doing a lot of like a pro immunization type stuff aimed at parents. And the problem is that a lot of the um, I guess advertising out there for vaccines is usually very like you know studies show that this is safe, um, and science says this, which is great for everybody who's already you know science based and has a trust in those things um, it doesn't work on parents who maybe that kind of message doesn't necessarily speak to them but the problem was I didn't know what kind of messages would speak to them and I realized I'm an expert in survey design and analysis so I decided I wanted to do this big study and look at that and ask people you know give different messages both for and against vaccines because I also want to know which messages on the other side are you know the big ones that are causing problems for us and the the problem was this is a huge project it required a lot of money it required traveling I couldn't do it on my own I have Women Thinking Free Foundation but we also don't have any money um, so I decided that I was going to get us resources and funding and basically I sent an email to DJ Grothy from the JREF I didn't even know him I kind of thought I was being a little bit crazy but I'm like you know what I'm just gonna tell him my idea and see what he says and a couple weeks later we sat in a meeting I gave him my idea he liked it and agreed to <laughs> fund it so I felt I've kind of learned that if I need Anytime I have these ideas that are just huge and anybody can do this, if you need other people and your idea is good, just ask. And it doesn't matter if you don't know them. I think everybody up here would be happy to you know, read and respond to one of your emails. And if you have a really good idea, we would, all of us up here and probably any other skeptic that you can possibly meet, no matter how big they are. I mean, even if they don't have time for it, they might be able to just, you know, uh, connect you with somebody who can. So just asking for help is huge because not every project is small. Um, the small ones are fantastic, but if it's bigger and it requires more people, just go ask for the help. Ask other people if they can help with time or resources or anything. I, I think that's a really fantastic point. And I, I, I want to just encourage people, um, you know, we're talking a lot about vaccines up here. <clears throat> That, that didn't used to be a skeptical topic in our in the skeptics community you know we, vaccines weren't really at the top of the list of things that were um, were being looked at you know Bigfoot and psychics and things like that were at the top of the list and what's happened is that you know a few people who were passionate about that went to the larger organizations and said this is important to us so you know we might be talking about some very specific topics but I hope that all of you are currently thinking of something that 
we don't even know exists. We don't even know it's a problem right now. You know it's a problem, and you want us to help, you know, or you want some other, you need help from some other larger organization that isn't addressing your topic at all. Um, that's great. You know, go to them, give them the resources, all the resources you can offer, and and like Jamie says, ask for help. You know, and it it could be, um, you know, anything. It could be absolutely any topic that that requires. You know, in the case of the skeptical community, any topic that you need to apply, you know, science and logic to. You know, to to make happen. Yeah, and. One more thing. Now I ha- I have women thinking free behind me, and I can do bigger projects. Um, the way I got into the Women Thinking Free Foundation, the way I got on the board, was literally I had a bunch of ideas for events and other things, and I was not even you know I wasn't a board member of Women Thinking Free. I just sent Elise Anders, the president, a bunch of emails with all my ideas. And she wrote back and she was like, those are great ideas. I think we'll do them. Um, I think at the time I wanted to do a big star party camping trip. And then I went out and I found where we were going to go, a place to stay, everything. And I just kept emailing her until after like two or three weeks. She was like, you know what? Why don't you just plan it? (laughs) (laughs) And so I did. And at the event, she asked me to join the board. And just a couple months later, I became vice president. So... I mean, now I have this organization behind me, but I got that just basically by having ideas and asking for help. And, and asking for help is definitely, people in this community are very open. When I first, you know, like I said, I registered the URL before I had any idea where to look for the data. And I, I asked uh, Steve Novella and Phil Plate, and they said that they were basically reporting off of news releases. And then it was uh, Jim Underdown at the Center for Inquiry in L.A., and he said that he used to subscribe to the paper edition of the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report because he's it was a, a fun, a fun conversation like piece. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> having, having that on the coffee table thing. was always created conversations. That is the sort of thing that an actual superhero might do, though. You know, I see that. <laughs> or a supervillain. Or that's the sort of right. thing a supervillain would do. Yeah. And the thing is, like, oh, okay, I found that out, and that's where all the data was. And then... I joined Twitter like um, two or three weeks before I launched the website, and I had just a, a handful of people that followed me, but a couple of them turned out to be really big, like Phil Plate. And when that, when the site launched, that first week, it was talked about. It was it was retweeted and and put on Facebook and stuff like that. But then there are articles written. Uh, for bad astronomy, Ferangula, respectful insolence, and Randy's uh, Swift. And I was just like, holy crap. (laughs) (laughs) And it was just like, I I thought it would be of some interest in the skeptical community. I didn't expect that if you Google search Jenny McCarthy, I generally come up number five or six. And I never could have possibly imagined that would happen. Because, as I've said before, I just made a website. And talking about time, you know, a lot of people ask, like, oh, do you ever need any help? Not now. It's like the original research of, it took a couple months to, to calculate things from 2007 up until 2009. But it takes, an, at most, an hour, you know, usually on a Saturday or Sunday morning. And to, to, to get the, the numbers, update the website, and, and post it. So it, it, these, these things, you know, if you find, and I agree with the idea of finding a, a niche rather than, because there's lots of general skepticism websites and organizations. Um, and it's a good idea if you have something that you're passionate about, a, a particular project, um, to just be focused on it because we need more and more things of, of that nature uh, that we can then point to and, 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 uh, and help get the word out about whatever the topic may, may be that, that is of your interest. Right, and I think uh, you, you bring up um, something that, that's kind of very close to my heart um, around activism in general and, and something that I think um, we, as we are, you know, as this sort of grassroots skeptical activism thing is happening, uh, it's becoming more and more clear uh, that it's really, really important when you're engaging in these things to figure out how do you measure success. 
uh, what is what are your criteria for success? So can you guys talk about um, some some of the types of things you do? I mean, obviously, Derek and and Tim, you guys are uh, the stuff that you're doing uh, is very much based on numbers. But um, but what are the sorts of things that you were kind of uh, using as your goals, and uh, and how do you track against those? Well, I, I guess for me, is I had no goals. I, I, I literally just was curious as to what the numbers were and just wanted to post them. I didn't expect it to become as big of a thing as it was, as, it, as it's become. Um, now, what's happened since the launching of it, the, the, most, the, the most satisfying thing is I didn't really know too many people um, in, in the, uh, on the autism spectrum uh, when I launched the site. And I've gotten to know several um, over the past couple of years through through it, and especially last year I launched a a Facebook page where a lot of people can communicate and and talk about other stories, not just related, but vaccine and autism advocacy in general. And it, the thing that just struck me is how many people who, with autism absolutely hate Jenny McCarthy. Um, <laughs> because she does not speak well about people who have autism. And they were very happy to have, to, 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 for there to be something that was countering her claims and, and, and getting those sorts of letters. And people, a lot of times I would get, I, I get emails and people say, I know you must get lots and lots of angry emails and, you know, but I just wanted to thank you for this. And I actually haven't really gotten hate mail. And I think it's because I'm not a blog. Um, you don't, the actual act, if you, it's really easy to do one click and post a comment, but having to do three clicks to actually open up your web, your, your email program, type something and send it, just dissuades people from sending me, you know, the hatred that, that other people have received, like, like Steve Novella and Rebecca and, and Phil Plate and, and so on. Um, I've gotten I've gotten you know quite perturbed emails, but but generally it, 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 it it's just it's so heartwarming when I get when I get people who, especially people who are on the autism spectrum who 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 write to me and 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 help. I think uh, I think that's it's a good point in in terms of uh, also what what audience are you trying to to reach and making sure you understand that um, Rebecca you know your focus tends to be on education in terms of your speaking and the blog and SGU so what are the sorts of things that you do in terms of figuring out what your target audience is and kind of speaking or changing your message based on who you're speaking to yeah I <clears throat> I, I certainly do try to to mix it up depending on who I'm speaking to um, like with this crowd, mostly single syllables, and uh, <laughs> that's just for me. <laughs> no, you're all very smart and lovely. Um, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the 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 master of this is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, we all, yeah, we all know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is. Right? For those of you who don't know. Uh, Tyson is a, uh, an astrophysicist who you might have seen on shows like The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, maybe. Um, he, and he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And he is a master at understanding his audience and changing his message accordingly. So he is who I, I strive to be. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of understanding their education level is one thing, uh, their age, obviously, but also, understanding their goals. So I, I'm often asked, and I was even asked today, a question from someone who was wondering how to approach friends who are buying into health scams. Um, in this case, it was uh, chocolate bars that are supposed to <clears throat> cure all sorts of uh, diabetes was one of the things. <laughs> yeah, no, I swear. As a type 1 diabetic, that doesn't work. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. And that's just it, because that's what we're talking about, isn't it? It's how to, you know, actually save lives. And so, yeah, that's something that could cause serious damage to someone. So what do you do? Not on a grand level, not on a, a big publicity sort of level. What do you do on, a, on an individual level? Well, understand, you know, 
where are your friends coming from? Why are they eating chocolate bars uh, in order to cure their diabetes? Um, what knowledge do they need to make the correct decision? Uh, what tools do they need to, to think critically about what they're doing? So I think it's really important to understand where, not just who your audi audience is, but what they're thinking, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, because I think that oftentimes um, we are quick to cast, the, the, uh, cast believers in, in certain things as the other side, uh, as, as people who are stupid, for instance. But they're not. Um, they're not even irrational. They do things for very rational reasons. It's just that the, they're starting from a different point than you started. And they might not be using skepticism in the same way that you're using skepticism. So I would encourage people to think about you know, when you're addressing an audience, whether it's your mother, or whether it's readers of your blog, or whether it's other users of your forum, uh, to, to think about where they're coming from and to understand that they are thinking, intelligent people just like you and uh, that they have agency as well. <laughs> um, I, and I think that that's, that's the best way that you'll, you'll, for you to craft your message and, and reach out to them. I think also the, the thing um, to remember now, all of us up here at, in some form, as Rebecca said, do something around vaccine advocacy. And, and, and that is one of kind of the more emotionally charged topics out there. Um, and, and so I think in terms of understanding your audience, um, do you guys have, I'm sure you guys have more experience on this than I do because all I've really done is the clinics, which I don't really, we haven't really had a lot of, uh, you know, kind of face-to-face -face issues. But um, how do you kind of handle kind of extreme opposition and arguments that are, you know, you know, highly emotional, not necessarily evidence-based, um, but also just there's so much, um, they have they have just so much invested in them because it's their children that they're talking about, and you have to tread very carefully, I think. Yeah, we, we, we've talked about this on SGU in the past, uh, and w what we always recommend is, you know, you, you are never going to convince someone in a single argument no one will ever argue with you and then be like, you know what, you are totally right and I am absolutely wrong. Um, if, if you do meet that person, marry him or her. Um, no, what you do, the best you can do, you plant the seed, is what we always say, plant the seed. Uh, give them the, the facts that they need and walk away. Give them the tidbits you know, that they need. Let them know that you're saying these things because you care about them and walk away. Because what happens when you walk away is that they calm down, they're not angry, they're not feeling threatened anymore, and they get to, to think about that little nugget of wisdom you dropped on them. And if it was the right nugget, then uh, they will you know, eventually, maybe, come around to thinking the same way you do. But they're gonna do it uh, in a way that makes them think that it was all their idea. <laughs> so you don't get any of the credit, but you maybe save a life. So it's kind of like being a mass superhero, <laughs> I guess. You know, Spider-Man never got any of the credit. Um, so Yeah, especially with the vaccine issue, the parents who I should say Peter Parker never got any of the credit. I'm sorry, I'm tired. Go on. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> Um, especially with the vaccine issue, the parents on the anti-vax side, um, it's always important to remember that they believe that they are right. They believe that what they are doing is right. They're not bad people. Um, and so I've always found just being empathetic and listening, especially in the beginning when they're telling you like why they feel the way they do and what they believe and that kind of thing. Um, the more empathetic you are, the more you listen and just kind of try to understand it from their point of view, the more they're qu going to kind of come around to trust you. And maybe then when you speak your message, they'll be a little bit more open. Like Rebecca said, it kind of plants the seed. But um, if you just come off right away as very aggressive and you're not listening or not really understanding the way that they are feeling at that moment, then they are just going to shut down. They're not going to listen to you, period. Yeah. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to have some time for questions, but I did have one question that I'd, I'll put to, to all of you, which is, um, 
what mistakes do you think you guys have made and, and what, it, you know, t tell us a little bit about sometimes that, this is actually the, the question I use when I'm interviewing people, but I, lo I love this question because uh, how people respond, I think, and particularly when it comes to activism, uh, how people respond to their, to the things that they do wrong is really, really important. Um, and I think learning from, I think it's much better to know what you've done wrong so that you can figure it out better for next time. Anyone? Oh, I've, Tim, I know you've never, never done anything wrong. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got one, which goes back to the question of, or the, what we were saying earlier about picking a niche. Uh, when I started What's the Harm, I started it as uh, kind of to answer the question. I had gone to the amazing meeting, which is, you know, like this event, not as large as this event, but it's all skeptic stuff all weekend. And, um, and it's fun and it's fantastic, and I highly recommend it. But on some level, there was sort of, I thought, maybe an opportunity to answer the question, well, why are we doing this? Why are we here? It's fun to you know, talk about how Yuri Geller is full of crap, but what are we doing it for? And that's how I kind of arrived at the, the question of harm. So when I first started the site, I was kind of wanting to cover as many skeptic topics as possible on what's the harm so that any skeptic who was interested in any particular thing would find something that they wanted. And I think that was a mistake because um, I have some categories on the site that I think you know anyone would, would say and I would admit are pretty weak. And uh, um, have some kind of weak cases because I was sort of grabbing everything I could. And if I had it to do again, I would be a lot carefuler about um, narrowing the focus and only adding a category when I felt like I had enough cases to really make a strong uh, point. Um, I think I, I can't say enough about specializing and finding a niche. And one of the reasons I say that is because I've, I've noticed in recent years um, situations where things that skeptics should have been taken care of dropped through the cracks because no one was making it their job. And the example that I always use is about a year and a half ago, there was an effort in Congress to amend a law called DSHE, which is the law from 1994 that allows people to sell herbal whatever in a jar and it does, they basically don't have to prove anything. They can take any plant, pretty much any plant they want, mash it up into a pill, <laughs> put it in a jar, and say, it'll improve your immune system. And it's a horrible law, and people sell a lot of junk uh, using it. And there was an effort in Congress to amend that law that got started by the sports industry, oddly enough, because some people had gotten hit for doping for taking what they thought were herbal stimulants that actually had drugs in them. And skeptics completely missed that this was going on. I think there was one blog post about it. And actually the blog post was after it was too late. The law was, had already you know, died in committee. And uh, we should have been on top of that. We should have been, as soon as that thing was introduced, we should have been all over that writing our congressmen. And if somebody had had a blog that was focusing on legislation relating to skepticism, they would have been the one waving the horn and waving the flags and getting everyone riled up about it. So somebody needs to jump into that niche and there's a hundred other niches that people need to jump into and make sure that someone's got their eyes on that topic so they can alert the rest of us to what's going on. I would say uh, with Women Thinking Free Foundation, obviously it's not just me, but as an organization, um, especially when I first came in, we had a lot of ideas and weren't very good at following through on any of them. Uh, we had a lot of ideas and they were all huge and um, consequently nothing got done. Um, and what we ended up having to do was we had this big meeting where we're like, we need to regroup, figure out you know, one to two things that we want to do right now and table everything else. I mean, the idea was originally we were gonna do everything at the same time and it was just, that wasn't gonna happen. and. Um, it ended up working out very well when we just, you know, picked two things, said this is what we're going to do right now, we still have our list of ideas, and once we finish the stuff we're working on, we can start that. And that's been far more successful, so, um, but I think it is very hard to just fall, fall into that hole where you have a million ideas, but you can't do any, each one takes so much commitment that if you're trying to do everything at once, it's just, it's just not gonna, none of it's going to happen. Well, one of the things that I really 
like about the Women Thinking Free is in addition to having your larger one or two goals is your, your quick response to stupidity, um, like the AMC theater issue. Uh, that was amazing. That if, for, for those who don't know, the uh, um, was it Age of Autism? I can't remember now. I think, but, I think that... But no, one, yeah. one of the autism, yeah. yeah one one of the anti-vax organizations had paid to run anti-vax advertisements in front of movies at AMC theaters last Thanksgiving, uh, that that long weekend where there's a lot of people going to the movies during that four-day weekend. Uh, Elise found out about it and told people that this was happening, and AMC got inundated with with complaints that they were going to allow this to happen. And it didn't happen. AMC made it so that they none of those commercials aired, and none of that that anti-vax material did not make it into the AMC theaters. And it was amazing that that happened. And it happened within about 24 to 48 hours. It, we heard about it, at least heard about it, and it was killed. Eight hours. Yeah. Eight hours? It, it was, was that fast? It really yeah. was like a bat phone situation in that one. Like, yeah. I think yeah. one of us called Elise, like, at 10 o'clock at night, there's, there's vaccine ads running, and then she, like, went into action. It was, it was literally eight yeah. hours. Yeah, Elise had media contacting her that wanted to report on it, and the stories ended up getting scrapped because it was resolved so quickly <laughs> that there was no more story. Yeah. We're yeah, gonna, we're gonna issue a press release. Oh, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that might lead into another good tip is that um, a lot of the best superheroes teamed up together, um, and so we have kind of a Justice League of skepticism uh, in terms of the skeptics. I mean, do, that's, do we have a clubhouse? And like we League? we have a villa. There is Skeptic <laughs> Island. <Yeah>. Pool boys. <laughs> It's kind of awesome. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't given a key. But, but yeah, I mean, it's true, though, and maybe, maybe that's something that I can use as, as a mistake I made at the beginning, was thinking that I could do it all by myself and that I wouldn't work well with others. But instead, I put out a call for writers on Skeptic, you know, years ago, and <clears throat> I, I just picked the, the funniest responses. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> And I, I really, I really lucked out. I, I just, got, I got some. I responded to that, yeah, and you sorry. never responded to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have been funnier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm glad you learned your lesson. Uh, <laughs> so, do we have any questions for the audience? <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, just, you know, we ended up with this team and we have a very rich behind the scenes conversation where we all support one another and uh, help each other. And that's when that, you know, when we found out about the ad airing in the cinema, um, there was an immediate, yeah, it's like the, the bat phone, you know, or the, you know, the spotlight goes out and we all team up. Well, you can do this and you can do that. Start the petition. I'll make the post. You do this. And it came together fast. So get a team. If you have friends that have skills that are complementary to your own, do it. You know, get it, get and, your superhero team. And together. sometimes the team is out there and you don't even know it and they come together. Like yeah. in the Mabus thing two yeah. weeks ago, right. uh, there was this, uh, I won't do the whole story, you can go to my blog and read it, but there was this guy who was basically harassing skeptics and atheists for like 15 years and we had had no luck uh, getting anything done about it. And on Twitter, a guy up in Montreal took an interest in the case, and several people, he, he said, hey, why haven't you guys reported on the police? And several people said, yeah, we've reported them, nothing's going to happen, don't bother. And, but a couple of us said, you know, uh, why don't you try it? We, we would appreciate your help. And I gave him some stuff, and he wrote a blog post, and another guy jumped in and created a petition, and none of us knew each other before that week. And it was eight days from when that started to when that guy was arrested by the police and put into custody. Looks like we have a, a question. Oh, bright lights, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. Yeah, yeah. try being over here. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> y'all have talked a lot about the uh, vaccinations. At, I'm on camera. Good <laughs> God. <laughs> anyway, yes, I do. Please I do. I'm all right calm. in my own superhero persona. 
<laughs> anyway, um, you've talked a lot about the vaccinations and uh, the, the anti-vaccine crowd. And I actually have this uh, friend, well, acquaintance, I think he may have been downgraded to after numerous aggravating conversations, whatever, uh, who is both anti-vaccine and anti-genetically modified crops. And there is a lot of just bunk out there about genetically modified crops and how it's population control, like, you know, the same with vaccines, and how that's really, really bad for you and they don't have any vitamins in them, which I know to be, you know, f which I know that information's false, but it's a matter of convincing these people that it, it that the information's bunk and it's, you know, he just frustrated me to the point where I, I just flat out told him he was full of shit. <laughs> And, and I think that was the last conversation I've had with him in a while. But anyway, uh, my question is, have you encountered uh, much in the way of GM crops and, you know, the, 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 uh, the facts and the fictions surrounding them, what, what's actual, you know, what's actual uh, information, what's misinformation and the like? Well, I... I uh, I don't have something specific about the, the GM uh, food, but there is a lot of cross-pollination amongst various forms of conspiracy theory. Uh, I've run into people on the Facebook uh, page for the Jenny McCarthy body count who have been not just anti-vaxxers, but uh, anti, you know, they, they think the, the moon hoax, you know, the, the, they're moon hoax believers. They're 9/11 truthers. They're, you know, they're, there's this weird, you know, this weird amalgamation of of, um, of of conspiracy theory that tends to wrap around. So I think it's one of those things like you people seem to be at that you believe in one sort of conspiracy theory, especially a governmental conspiracy theory, then you're liable to believe other governmental conspiracy theories. I mean, it got so bad, there's only been a few times I've had to ban people from the site. And almost every time it's happened is when they started to claim that shaken baby syndrome is a side effect of vaccines. That violently shaking your child does not cause harm to the child. And that, it, that the, what is diagnosed as shaken baby syndrome is a vaccine reaction. I ban those people when that when that comes up. But yes, there is this really strong conspiracy theorist bent to 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 some of these people. And I think that that's a, a good uh, cause for 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 looking at what's lying behind people's beliefs, not just what they're saying they believe, but why. And um, I think what you're talking about is a fundamental distrust of the government. Um, that's, well, which you know, this guy yeah, has. Yeah, you know, and, and we're a fundamental distrust of large corporations, which are both perfectly normal things, but you know, and, and healthy things, but when taken to an extreme, can lead to <clears throat> dangerous belief systems. Um, I don't think that uh, not liking GM crops is a dangerous belief at this point. Um, but you know, I I think it's not based on science, and there are resources out there that will be better than what I'm telling you um, right now. So I just recommend hitting the, the Googles. I'll I'll give you a name to Google. <clears throat> Look for a guy by the name of Kevin Folta, F O L T A. He's a scientist in Gainesville, Florida. I assume at the University of Florida. He gave a presentation at TAM eight um, on the whole GM foods thing, and he has a lot of really sensible stuff about about it. I mean, we talked Kevin about it on S. Folta? You a few weeks ago too. Yeah, actually. Folta. Folta. F O L T A. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to know if any of the panelists or anyone in the audience is as pissed off as I am about psychic storefronts. They're everywhere, everywhere. And what I want to know: has there been any investigation of business licensing, certification of claims? Um, regulations regarding their claims of being psychics and um, perhaps even looking into their tax payments. Can we get rid of them that way? 
um, can, is there any type of um, survey as to how many people go into these psychic storefronts? I'd like to see that kind of investigation take place. Is anyone on the panel interested in that or anyone in the audience interested in that? There have been a few cities that have instituted permitting for psychics um, with uh, minimal amounts of success. I think the, the problem is um, a disinterest, like laws are passed in order to protect consumers from frauds, basically. Um, a distinguished, but you know, it, the, the problem is distinguishing between psychics who are doing the for entertainment purposes only daily, where they ch they're charging $10 for a palm read and who cares, you know, compared to, uh, you know, the, the psychics who are bilking people out of their life savings, who are um, giving them health advice, things like that. Um, and it, there is, I think, a bit of disinterest on the side of law enforcement, even in places that have laws in place, there's a disinterest in investigating them fully. So, uh, you know, I think that there is room for people who really want to get involved in, in encouraging law enforcement to do that. Um, I, I think that's a good... There, yeah. there's, there's also a, um, the additional problem in the, in the few areas that have done um, uh, permitting and licensing, all of a sudden then those psychics get to say that they are licensed by the local government, yeah. right. which then yeah. creates a whole other right. set yeah. of problems. Um, for fun, actually my, my first skeptical based website um, was the Psychic Union. And it was it's a joke website and it, it's designed as, you know, it's got lots of flowery images and, you know, <laughs> halos and all sorts of things up there. And it's basically, it's, it says, you know, there are, there is such a rash of, of illegitimate psychics, be sure to ask for their psychic union card to make sure that they're legitimate. Um, and there are several hints that this is a joke. Uh, the, the bookstore is a link to Prometheus. <laughs> There's there's an ad for the, for a, uh, there's a contest for one million dollars for the best psychic. Um, <laughs> I wonder there, where that goes. Yeah, and and I, one of my favorite uh, bits is if you go to the page for all the um, the the legitimate psychics, it's a blank page. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a registration page that I have on there where I just went through the skeptics dictionary and just pulled out all the things that sounded neat and it's a little checkbox for people if they want to register to become part of the psychic union and I never expected anyone to actually register I thought I thought the joke was pretty clear especially when I included possible psychic abilities such as lycanthropy <laughs> and rumpology and and other things along that line but there have been, I'm trying to remember now, it's been a while since I've looked at it. There's been, a, I think, 60 to 70 people <laughs> over the years that have registered. Um, 15 to 20 are werewolves. <laughs> so. I think I'm one of those, actually. That's awesome. and, well, the, it, it's, it's like, I, 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 originally there was like ideas, it was back when I was with the Independent Investigations Group, and the first person who actually applied was near the, the IIG in LA, and was starting to think like, well, maybe we can do this as a way to find people to test. And then I started getting people from other parts of the country and other parts of the world, and I was like, no, I just have, I just have a, a form letter that goes out now saying, I'm sorry, but this is not real. Mm -hmm. you know, in a hundred years of, of testing, no one's proven these abilities. But if you think you can, contact the IIG. This, this is a good example of where the stuff that I do, the Internet stuff, uh, is really interesting because, you know, 30 years ago, if we were asking that question, it might have been a, a, a multi-thousand dollar project for CSI to do a national survey and look in phone books and try to figure out how many psychics there were. Now, all the phone listings, all the business listings are in Google or in other resources online, and there are ways to scrape that information. So if somebody wanted to do a project and figure out how many tarot readers have a phone number in the United States and where are they? Are there more on the East Coast? and the West Coast or stuff like that. That's stuff that you could all do, you could do electronically for free at home just using off-the-shelf tools and it would be a fascinating skeptical project. I think we have time for one more. Cool. Uh, I think the uh, funny thing about that website is if they were really psychic, they would have known it was a joke. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, and my, favorite, my favorite subtle joke is the name of it, the Psychic yeah. Union, the P.U. <laughs> <laughs> it stinks. Um, <clears throat> so, I, sorry. Uh, 
I have a little sister who is just recently uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and so I'm a little more sensitive to some of this stuff. And I had no idea that something like that anti-diabetes chocolate bar existed. Um, so A, how is that legal? Maybe this goes back to what you were saying about the, the, the congressional proposal and stuff like that. And B, what can we do to f seek these things out and maybe try to get them, you know, as, uh, as, as opposed to appealing directly to people that might have uh, fallen for it, how else can we find this stuff out and try to get it off the market? It, it, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> it's legal because they use weasel words in their right. claims. Uh, you're not allowed to make a specific medical claim. Someone could not say this candy bar cures diabetes, but they could say helps alleviate diabetes symptoms maybe or something like that. Uh, and so uh, holding their feet to the fire on that wording and knowing what wording is legal and what isn't. And this is another great site somebody could do. A lawyer who understands this stuff could do a blog on what to look for and what not to look for and what to complain to the FTC about and um, the FDA. Another thing is, uh, I mean, there's so many crazy projects. Uh, products like that out there that it can get overwhelming um, but one thing you can do is pick one of them like that chocolate bar and really focus on that one thing and put all the energy towards that I mean that's what the skeptical community has done with power band and then um, what um, Reese has done with the um, miracle miracle mineral solution, miracle mineral <laughs> solution. Yeah. Yeah, and something in that after. works better than trying to go after everything at once yeah, and, and I just want to encourage you, you know, if, especially if you or a loved one has the, the disease or whatever it is that, that, this, that a quack cure is being marketed to, um, please get involved and don't, uh, you know, you, you said besides, you know, those sort of one-to-one -one, um, communication with people who are affected, uh, that's actually really, really important. And I'll give you, you know, Reese is one example. You know, I'm sure that there are plenty of people on the forum he was on who did read what he said and did take it to heart. You know, he got a lot of pushback, but there were still a lot of people who uh, understood that he had that disease, that he understood what they were going through as well, and it made them more likely to associate with him and to listen to what he was saying. And I just want to give you one more quick example. Um, a friend of mine runs a forum for preeclampsia, which is something that pregnant women can get. Um, it's uh, high, blood, high blood pressure during pregnancy. <clears throat> and it's at preeclampsia.org slash forum. So she's a moderator on this forum. And uh, she helps mothers, uh, expecting mothers, who are dealing with this. She's been there. She has a doctor who's also on the forum with her. And she goes in, and when, when women, her problem is that women don't take it seriously enough um, when, in fact, it is a serious condition, and they think that it can be treated with things like uh, change of diet and things like that. So she goes in, she gives them the hard facts of this is what can happen if you ignore this. And then she has this doctor come in and give them the science behind it. And together, you know, on a one-by-one one -one basis, they are helping these women. They're helping save these women's lives and their, their babies' lives. And they're helping save the lives of anyone who happens to Google this condition, end up on that forum, find that question, and read their explanation. So it, it can make a huge difference, especially if you yourself are suffering from the disease. Um, people are more likely to listen to you. People with that disease will relate to you. So please do it. It's an easy, sort of easy way for you to get involved and to actually save lives. Well, thanks very much. I think we're out of time. I, uh, I do have some other resources that we've compiled, but what I'm going to do is put, um, put up a post on Skeptic um, next week and uh, include all of our links and resources so you can get more information there at skeptic.org. Thanks. <laughs>